Welcome to Macroeconomic Modeling for Sustainable Development Planning, Modeling with System Dynamics. This course will be taught by Dr. Suleiman Diakiti. In this first module, you are going to learn about the definitions of system dynamics and its key concepts. The objective of this module is to establish a foundation of knowledge in system dynamics science, allowing you to understand the principles of system dynamics, key definitions, and structural approach to system dynamics. It will also allow you to understand the modeling process with system dynamics, including flow diagrams, stocks, and mathematical representations. Finally, this module will show you practical examples of definitions of flow variables, stocks, and parameters. At the end of this module, you will have a good command of system dynamics theory, including its history and definition. You will also have a good knowledge of key concepts of the dynamics of the system, including causal loop diagrams, diagram of flows, and stocks. You will also be able to specify whether a macroeconomic or social demographic variable is a flow or a stock variable. Forrester, the founder of System Dynamics, defined it as the investigation of the information feedback characteristics of managed systems and the use of models for the design of improved organizational form and guiding policy. Wollstenholm defined system dynamics as a rigorous method for qualitative description, exploration, and analysis of complex systems in terms of their processes, information, organizational boundaries and strategies, which facilitates quantitative simulation modeling and analysis for the design of system structure and behavior. System dynamics is an approach to understanding the nonlinear behavior of complex systems over time using stocks, flows, internal feedback loops, table functions, and time delays. We have points in common between these definitions, but at the end of the course, we shall challenge you to define system dynamics for yourself. System dynamics was originally developed in the 1950s to help corporate managers improve their understanding of industrial processes. System dynamics is currently being used throughout the public and private sector for policy analysis and design. Convenient graphical user interface system dynamic software was developed into user-friendly versions by the 1990s and has been applied to diverse systems. System dynamic models solve the problem of simultaneity by updating all variables in small time increments with positive and negative feedback and time delays. Perhaps the best known system dynamics model is the limits to growth 1972. This model forecasts that exponential growth of population and capital with finite resources and perception delays would lead to economic collapse during the 21st century under a wide variety of growth scenarios. Now that we have discussed some of the underlying ideas of what system dynamics is, we turn to the underlying five-stage approach for its application, which is shown in figure one. The first stage is to recognize the problem and to find out which people care about it and why. It is rare to find the right answers at this stage. Secondly, and the first stage in system dynamics, comes the description of the system by means of an influence diagram, which is sometimes also called a causal loop diagram. This is a diagram of the forces at work in the system which appear to be connected to the phenomena 
underlying people's concern. Influence diagrams are constructed following well-established techniques, which will be explored in the next point. The arrow that leads from stage 2 to stage 4 will be explained in a moment. Having developed an initial diagram, attention moves to stage 3, qualitative analysis. This term simply means looking closely at the influence diagram in the hope of understanding the problem better. This is, in practical system dynamics, the most important stage which often leads to significant results. Indeed, the problem is sometimes solved at this stage and there is no need to continue on to the other stages. This is the meaning of the dotted line between stages 3 and 4. Stage 3, the analyst draws on so-called bright ideas and pet theories. The former arises from experience with other problems. One may have seen something like the set of feedback loops for this problem in some other case, and what was learned then might be applicable here. That, of course, does not help the inexperienced analyst, who may have to rely on looking for obvious inadequacies in the system. If, for example, it contains negative feedback loops which have no clear desired states, then it is very unlikely to be successful in eliminating discrepancies and may well be showing evidence of being out of control. The number of people available could be a symptom of that. Similarly, a system which should be growing ought to have positive loops. If they cannot be found in the influence diagram, then a diagnosis of the problem may be emerging. Pet theories are frequently even more useful. They are the views of experienced people in the system as to what is wrong with it. The views themselves may be found to be wrong on deeper analysis. And the reasons why they are wrong are usually of great interest. But they are almost always a useful source of knowledge about the problem and should be searched for by the analyst. If qualitative analysis does not produce enough insight to solve the problem, work proceeds to stage four, the construction of a simulation model. At this stage, we exploit the important property that the influence diagram can be drawn at different levels of aggregation. It is usually not even necessary to show every single detail because the influence diagram has been properly drawn the simulation model can be written from it without a separate stage of flow charting. Stage 5, the final stage, involves exploring the model and policy design by simulation. It also involves policy design by optimization. The process of system dynamics and influence diagrams is about emphasizing the relationships between stages of work and the results to which they end up. This is shown in figure 2. The primary elements of system dynamic diagrams are feedback, accumulation of flows into stocks, and time delays. Influence diagrams are sometimes called causal loop diagrams. There is little or no difference, but a causal loop diagram is best thought of as an influence diagram at a very broad level, which does not show the fine details which can be included in an influence diagram. In the system dynamics methodology, a problem or a system which can be an ecosystem, political system, or mechanical system, may be represented as a causal loop diagram. A causal loop diagram is a simple map of a system with all its components and their interactions. By capturing interactions and consequently the feedback loop, see figure 3 on the next page, a causal loop diagram reveals the structure of a system 
By understanding the structure of a system, it becomes possible to ascertain a system's behavior over a certain time period. Causal loop diagrams consist of variables, which are things, actions, or feelings that are connected by causal links, which are arrows with polarities and delays. Together, these create positive and negative feedback loops that describe the circles of cause and effect that take on a life of their own. We have four basic elements. The variables, the links between them, the signs on the links, and the signs of the loop. Figure 3 shows an example of a causal loop diagram and its notation. Here, we have the key which shows the link polarity, the causal link, the positive reinforcing loop, and the negative balancing loop, which are loop identifiers. The two things that cause the population to change are births and deaths. So we use arrows to represent these causal links. We know that more births lead to a greater population, and fewer births will lead to a lower population, all else equal. We will say this relationship has a positive polarity, meaning that the two variables move in the same direction. That is, more leads to more, or less leads to less. We indicate that a causal relationship has a positive polarity by placing a positive sign next to the arrowhead. We also know that more deaths lead to a lower population and fewer deaths lead to a greater population. These variables move in the opposite direction. More leads to less, or less leads to more. So we will say that this relationship has a negative polarity. We represent this by labeling the arrowhead with a negative sign. These causal links are true independently. And they are also both true at the same time. On their own, they don't tell us exactly what's happening to the population. The direction of change in population is determined by whichever of these two relationships is dominant. As long as births exceed deaths, population will grow. And whenever deaths exceed births, the population will shrink. Now, we can introduce some feedback into the model. While more births lead to a greater population, a greater population also leads to more births, since more people make more babies, given a birth rate stays constant. That is why we say all else equal, because we only consider the two variables that we are linking when we think about polarity. Therefore, we draw a positive causal link from population back to birth. Let us introduce some feedback into the model. While more births lead to a greater population, a greater population also leads to more births, since more people make more babies, given a birth rate stays constant. This is why we say, all else equal because we only consider the two variables that we are linking when we think about polarity. Therefore, we draw a positive causal link from population back to birth. In figure 4, this link forms our first feedback loop. It is shown on the left side of figure 4. A feedback loop is what we call a set of relationships where one variable leads to a change in another variable that eventually leads to a change in the original variable. To read a feedback loop, you pick a variable to start with and arbitrarily pick a direction, either more or less. 
We can read figure 4. By starting with population and more. More population leads to more births, which leads to more population. This is called a reinforcing feedback loop, which is marked with the bolded R. Because more births today lead to more births in the future. Births reinforce births. Similarly, less births will lead to a lower population, which will lead to less births in the future. The reinforcing process works in the opposite direction too. If this were the only feedback loop in the population system and people did not die, then we would see exponential growth in the number of people. We see a different type of feedback loop when we examine deaths. More deaths today lead to fewer deaths in the future. This is because more deaths today will cause the population to fall, which means less people will be around to die later. These types of loops are called balancing feedback loops, marked with a B. Since more leads to less, or less leads to more, the original change is balanced by a change in the opposite direction. Feedback loops take a life of their own. We see a set of relationships that are always happening over and over again, generating behavior that unfolds over time. These two feedback loops can cause a few different behaviors based on the birth rate and life expectancy. We will observe population growing and growing even faster as long as the reinforcing birth loop dominates and leveling off if the death balancing loop is dominant. Figure 4 has two hash marks on the causal link between population and births and between population and deaths. Hash marks represent a delay, a situation where it takes time before the effect plays out. It takes time for an individual to be of age to have a child, which is why there is a delay between population and births. This delay is longer in some countries like New Zealand, where the average woman has children at age 29, whereas it is less than 20 years of age in certain developing countries. The delay in deaths is one where we see huge differences across various countries. In Japan, the life expectancy is over 80 years of age, while it is only 49 years in Afghanistan. Delays have important implications. So whenever you run into one, think to yourself, how long is this delay? If delays are relatively long, that could lead to a lag in responsiveness or inability to adapt. That is, you simply can't change the population instantly. Whereas, if delays are very short or non-existent, the system might be more sporadic. The delay it takes for people to change their opinions is very short in a young child and very long in adults. Some adults never change their worldviews after a certain age. Now, we shall take a look at a model that captures a resource-constrained poor country. Figure 5 represents a population model with resource constraints. Can you trace the two new balancing and reinforcing loops and make sense of them? We are going to give it a try. We'll begin with a new balancing loop on the bottom right. As population increases, the number of resources per person falls. And when this happens, the average life expectancy will also fall, since fewer resources mean less food, a weaker economy, fewer doctors, and fewer jobs. As life expectancy falls, the rate of deaths increases, which causes the population to fall. This balancing loop makes sense, but it will only come into play given that resource constraints are a serious issue. Another interesting thing plays out as related to life expectancy in the new reinforcing loop on the bottom left. 
When life expectancy falls and infant mortality rates increase, people may desire to have larger families. This ultimately leads to more children in each household, which increases the population size, exacerbates resource constraints, and decreases life expectancy further. This reinforcing loop represents a vicious cycle where people essentially get what they want in the present at the expense of the future. Does this mechanism make sense? It certainly wouldn't apply in every context, but in some situations, you could imagine how a mother expecting several of her children to die before they reach a ripe old age would want to have more children in anticipation of early deaths. This model is true in the context of a prevailing set of factors, for example, resource constraints, and beliefs that having many children is the best way to ensure that you have a family in the future. Keep in mind that this is just one simplified population model of a hypothetical population. It may represent some countries more than others. For example, some would argue that the link between resources and life expectancy is a weak one, as long as technological progress and innovation allow us to support our consumption habits without extracting resources at too high of a rate. But others argue that technology can only do so much and that even the U.S. will eventually reach its limits. Some believe that we are using oil as if we were fetching water from a well. We have no idea how much is left, so we behave as if it is bottomless. The particular problem and context of a model should always be clear. Models are used to frame problems and answer questions. They are explicit theories of why something behaves the way it does. They should help to clarify what is being considered and what is being excluded and present opportunities to suggest corrections and additions and improvements. Table 1 represents the link, polarity, definitions and examples. Figure 6 represents an example of the causal loop diagram of the new product introduction. There are two feedback loops in Figure 6. The positive reinforcement loop, labeled R on the right, indicates that the more people have already adopted the new product, the stronger the word of mouth impact. There will be more references to the product, more demonstrations, and more reviews. This positive feedback should generate sales that continue to grow. The second feedback loop on the left is negative reinforcement or balancing and hence labeled B. Clearly, growth cannot continue forever because as more and more people adopt, there remain fewer and fewer potential adopters. Both feedback loops act simultaneously, but at different times they may have different strengths. Thus, one might expect growing sales in the initial years and then declining sales in the later years. However, in general, a causal loop diagram does not specify the structure of a system sufficiently to permit determination of its own behavior from the visual representation alone. Loop diagrams are important in visualizing a system structure and behavior they are also useful in analyzing the system qualitatively. To perform a more detailed quantitative analysis, a causal loop diagram is transformed into a stock and flow diagram. A stock and flow model helps in studying and analyzing the system in a quantitative way. Such models are usually built and simulated using computer software. A stock is the term for any entity that accumulates or depletes over time. A flow is the rate of change in a stock. Here, we can see that a flow is the rate of accumulation of the stock. From our previous example, there are two stocks, potential adopters and adopters. There is one flow, new adopters, for every new adopter, 
the stock of potential adopters declines by one, and the stock of adopters increases by one. Figure 7 shows us the stock and flow diagramming notation. Four equivalent representations of stock and flow structures, and each representation contains exactly the same information. We have several examples of stocks and flows with their units of measure. For instance, the choice of time unit for the flows can be days, weeks, or years, and it is arbitrary, but it must be consistent within a single model. Figure 8 shows us a mathematical representation of stocks and flows. Here, figure 9 shows us an example of stocks and flows diagram. Figure 10 shows us an example of negative feedback from chicken and road crossings. Positive loops are self-reinforcing. In this case, more chicken lay more eggs, which hatch and add to the chicken population, leading to still more eggs, and so on. A causal loop diagram captures the feedback dependency of chickens and eggs. The arrows indicate the causal relationships. The positive sign at the arrowheads indicate that the effect is positively related to the cause. An increase in the chicken population causes the number of eggs laid each day to rise above what it will have been. And vice versa, a decrease in the chicken population causes eggs laying to fall below what it will have been. The loop is self-reinforcing, hence the loop polarity identifier R. If this loop were the only one operating, the chicken and egg population would grow exponentially. Of course, no real quantity can grow forever. There must be limits to growth. These limits are created by negative feedback. Figure 1 shows an example of negative loops. Negative loops are self-correcting. They counteract change. As the chicken population grows, various negative loops will act to balance the chicken population with its carrying capacity. One classic feedback is shown here. The more chickens, the more road crossings they will attempt. If there's any traffic, more road crossings will lead to fewer chickens, hence the negative polarity for the link from road crossings to chickens. An increase in the chicken population causes more risky road crossings, which then brings the chicken population back down. The B in the center of a loop denotes a balancing feedback. If the road crossing loop was the only one operating, say because the farmer sells all the eggs, the number of chickens would gradually decline until none remained. All systems, no matter how complex, consist of networks of positive and negative feedbacks. And all dynamics arise from the interaction of these loops with one another. What are the dynamics of the chicken population when both loops are simultaneously active? Figure 12 shows the dynamics arising from the interaction of multiple loops. We ask you to sketch a graph showing the behavior of the chicken population over time. Assume that the initial chicken population is small, but includes at least one rooster. We have now come to the end of the first module. There are four practice questions. Please quiz yourself and check the notes for the answers. Good luck and let us meet in the second module.